We have a distinguished panel here. We have Michael Cart, our chief librarian. And Michael has lots of wonderful stories, because I've heard some of them. I hope he'll be sharing those with you tonight. And uh, Bob Anderson is the great-grandson of um, Mar uh, Margaret Anderson, who owned the Beverly Hills Hotel. And uh, we have Beatrice and Winston Miller, who are longtime residents and active in the Historical Society. And I'm going to hand this over to Bob so you can start. Hi, I'm Bobby Anderson, and as Phyllis said, uh, my great-grandmother was the original owner of the Beverly Hills Hotel. And um, my father, who would have been much better to uh, speak here this evening, this is him on his pony at the Beverly Hills Hotel when he was a little boy. My uh, great-grandparents, um, I should say my great-grandmother, uh, originally owned the Hollywood Hotel in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. They, uh, sh the ladies, she was in partnership at the Hollywood Hotel. Um, they had a difference of opinion on how business was to be run. And when she came out to run the Beverly Hills Hotel, um, she in fact did load up the guests and the, and the most prized employees and took them with her by horse and buggy to the Beverly Hills Hotel and uh, subsequently uh, opened up for business. No. This is just before the Depression, and uh, my family had sold, sold the hotel for a couple of million dollars then, um, which was a lot of money back then. <laughs> and I have uh, appraisals uh, of the hotel, lock, stock, and barrel from July 13th of 1922, that states the value of the Beverly Hills Hotel and all grounds to be uh, $213,000. <laughs> now, uh, now this includes all furniture, um, liquor, liquor that you know probably wasn't supposed to be there, um, and as we know, it sold in excess. What is it, 150 million dollars, Winston? The city is incredible. It was a failure when it started. Uh, Burton Green and his group came to drill for oil, and the oil was no good. Now uh, it was 1907. Uh, and Rockefeller was forming the oil trust. There was a caused a depression in the country, and the city failed. They couldn't do anything. So the Green family decided with the, their partners who they had was that they'd better build the hotel and see if they could subdivide the place. Well, it was a flop. The hotel was plenty of problems, lots of problems. Uh, Mrs. Anderson had a very tough time with it the first few years. I mean, it's come a long ways. Um, values of property, et cetera. I mean, when uh, this meeting I had last week, they wanted to know where the values were going and in Beverly Hills, and my family owns property on Beverly Drive and Rodeo Drive, and um, you know I have the property profiles on these properties and what what rents were, you know, in the 20s and 30s, and they were uh, a nickel, eight cents a square foot, and uh, today Rodeo Drive commands upwards of $25 a square foot a month, um, or the equivalent of $225 annual which was probably what one of these whole buildings brought in in a year. When Hernando Courtright took over the hotel, uh, he took it over in the 30s. Uh, he was a receiver for the Bank of America. He's the vice president. He had to take over the hotel because the Anderson family was having a few problems, as were every other person in the hotel business. So Courtright became the manager and established a presence. And he did everything with a flair. From his decoration, the hotel painted pink with the dark green. Those colors were famous all over the country. You'd go into a living room, you'd see a dark green wall because Don, L Don Loper had decorated the hotel uh, for Courtright. Everything he did was with a flair, Mikasa Sukasa. He's even got it in the concrete, uh, in the tile in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, which he took over later on. I just put together uh, these slides to show this, uh, the Sultan of Brunei's staff, who's the present owner of the hotel. And they thought this was a riot. I mean, seeing these rooms, and um, they were really thrilled. And it was quite an education. And I think they're going to think of the hotel a little differently now, too. They're, uh, they're restoring some of the guest rooms. The opening dinner and, uh, dates back to uh, May 13, 1912. And it lists the, um, the music that was played. And I wish I could pronounce some of this music. Um, and then it goes on to the, the dinner that was served was Beverly Hills 
strawberries on stem, consomme, um, broiled tenderloin of sole, tartar sauce, braised filet of beef, fresh mushrooms, asparagus tips, broiled squab on toast, um, fruit salad baskets, frozen birds in a nest, and assorted cakes. There's not a price on that one. I'm sure if you were invited to this that you were an honored guest and they might have taken the 250 on the cuff. Then I have the original wine lists. Bottles of, of mum were uh, 250 for a, uh, for a smaller bottle and $5 for a larger bottle. Beers were 20 cents. Most of the memories that, that I have of that time are what a small town it was. Like, we used to go up behind the Beverly Hills Hotel and rent a horse. And that's how I learned to ride English saddle along the bridle path you saw. And there was no problem with traffic. You'd walk the horses to cross the cross streets and every traffic would give you the right of way. And when we first moved to our present house, well, I left when I went back east to school and came back to Beverly in 1959 on the Rodeo Drive, and it still had the bridle path. But the city wanted to take the bridle path out. They said it congested traffic, made the two lanes too narrow on either side. And they said they wouldn't fix the potholes unless we took, agreed to take it out. But all the residents went down and argued it out, and they decided to take out the bridle path, which was no longer active anyway, just a lot of dust. And they narrowed it, planted it with lawn, widened the street, and up until a year or two ago, when for some unknown reason they decided to take out the lawn and plant oleanders, it was, it was great. Everybody loved it. It gave you a feeling of space. I was talking to Winston uh, before we saw the slideshow about the extraordinary changes that have visited Beverly Hills even in the past 14 years that I've been here. Um, and I was thinking that might be best epitomized in the passage of all of the wonderful bookstores that used to be here. You all, you all remember, certainly, Hunters and Martindale's, Brentano's, and um, there were a host of specialty bookstores that used to be here. Um, even when I first came here 14 years ago, I used to spend my lunch hours strolling amongst all the bookstores. I came in 1937, but I will say that I had never seen a place like Beverly Hills. Coming from New York City, you know any New Yorkers who are here, you live in the city or you live in the country. And when I looked at Beverly Hills, and Winston showed me where he used to live, and I saw these beautiful houses, but so close together, these beautiful lawns and gardens, I didn't know what was in back. I'd never, ever seen a place like that. And I really don't think there are many places like Beverly Hills anywhere in the world. Later on, I came to appreciate how lovely it was. At the time, I thought, well, I, I really would rather live in the country, which is what we did. We went to the valley and bought an acre of property on a dirt road with lots of trees. And until we moved back in to Rodeo Drive, I didn't know much about Beverly, but it intrigued me. And I came to see what a unique place this is in the world, I think. In those days, when I first came, I was dumb enough to go shopping in downtown Los Angeles. This is an odd evening for me. We're thinking about the past, but I, of course, have been thinking for the last five years about the future, as we've been building our new 92,000-square-foot library. I came across earlier today, when I was looking for some photos, minutes, of the old library board. Some of you will recall that the first library uh, in Beverly Hills was operated by the county of Los Angeles. Beverly Hills, of course, has always had a great pride in its independence and uh, very quickly opened its own municipal library with its own board of trustees. The original library was located in the business district, and then, of course, when the city hall was opened um, around 1928, the library was moved uh, to, I believe, the second floor. An antidote that uh, I'll probably tell is a friend of mine, their house was being remodeled, and they were staying in the Hilton Hotel which uh, my friends and I thought was pretty neat. And uh, we were high up there, and uh, oftentimes we'd come from El Rodeo School, and go and play around the hotel, and we would drop water balloons out the window. I don't think the security ever found us. You were the one that Yes, yes. <laughs> and I also had uh, occasion to meet uh, Hubert Humphrey uh, in the lobby of the hotel when he was vice president under Johnson. 
and he was staying in the hotel, and I remember asking, I was just interested, how much did, did a suite up there in the, the presidential suite cost? And I remember it was an astronomical $100 a night. <laughs> I also remember that uh, the coffee shop there, which was a little more expensive than most places, uh, the hamburgers there were 85 cents, which was kind of a lot there. The, the presidential suite now is about $3,000 a night? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am Jacques Foti. I am with the John Douglas Real Estate Company, but I'm not really a Beverly Hills resident, except I'm a member of this delightful, intimate society. And I remembered many years ago, when I was younger, I used to be in show business, and as a piano vocalist, I appeared at the Beverly Hilton. For about a year, they had a room called the Rendezvous Room. It is no longer there, but some of you might remember and uh, the Mr. Hilton and the managers, they had a slogan. First of all, the whole hotel was full of Hungarian. I'm from Budapest myself, and I knew that if you come to Hollywood, you look up Joe Pasternak and uh, Cosma and all these Hungarian directors, Paul, and your career will be made. As just mentioned, you're a Hungarian. And uh, actually, by the time I got to Hollywood, it seems that the Hungarian clique was over, and if you mentioned you're a Hungarian, you couldn't get arrested, you know? <laughs> so, <coughs> actually, that is the reason I'm in real estate, and I never made it big in the movies. But I understand many of the Hungarians were employed in the Beverly Hilton, and I believe even today, if you go to one of the maitre d' and many of the waiters, for some reason, uh, full of Hungarians. So they had a slogan, in the manager's office, and it said, a Hungarian is the only one that can follow you through a revolving door and come out ahead of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Michael, do you have anything that you can add at this point? Whenever I go outside of Beverly Hills uh, to speak to other library groups or people uh, across the country, the question that's always asked is not how many volumes do you have in the library or what kinds of reference questions are you asked, it's do the movie stars use the library? <laughs> well, the answer is yes. Uh, the movie stars, the famous and sometimes the infamous, have used the library. Uh, very shortly before I came here, you may remember that John Dean, having blown the whistle on his former boss, Richard Nixon, who, by the way, was also once a patron of the Beverly Hills Public Library, but before he became president, um, Mr. Dean, having blown the whistle on uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, decided to move to uh, the sunny Southland and came to the West Coast and took up residence in Beverly Hills and in due course presented himself at the library to register for a library card. Well, this was before the days of the cooperative library system we belong to now, and you must know that not just everybody could get a library card at the Beverly Hills Public Library. You had to prove that you were a resident of the city. And the clerk at the circulation desk explained the rules to Mr. Dean, explained that he had to have two forms of identification, which confirmed his address in Beverly Hills. And he said, well, he just moved here, and he didn't have any proof of residence or a proof of his address at that point in time, but he desperately needed the library card. So I don't know if my, uh, my clerk were a Democrat or a Republican, but apparently she was trying to be helpful and suggested to him, well, if you don't have any identification, perhaps you have a friend who could vouch for your address. And he thought about that for a moment, and then he said, I have no friends. <laughs> I want to get a time frame from the Millers. When, when did you come out here? Well, my family moved out from St. Louis in 1920. <clears throat> we moved to Beverly Hills in 1924, 808 North Crescent Drive. And at that time, there were no stop signs leading into that melange of roads from you know, Sunset going both ways, uh, Beverly Drive, Crescent Drive, Beverly Drive North, no stop signs. So everybody just headed for the middle. <laughs> and we used to hear at least two crashes a day at home. <laughs> and one of them was my car. <laughs> <laughs> the things that you don't think of now, for instance, nobody had fences, at least on my street we didn't, all the dogs ran loose. 
all over town. And uh, we took our dog once to Dr. Kagi's on Foothill Small Animal Hospital for something, and the next morning they called us up and said, your dog is waiting on the doorstep when we got here. So they fed him and we called for him, and he did that three mornings in a row. He came from North Crescent Drive, Donny Kagi's. And my father said, keep him all day and don't feed him. And he never went back again. <laughs> But it was such a small town feeling. One more anecdote, it doesn't add to the culture. Uh, we had a guy work for us who tended to get drunk on his days off. And frequently the police would call my father and say, we got Jeff, what do we do with him? And if he was not too drunk, they'd drive him home. If he was too drunk, they'd let him sleep it off in jail and bring him home the next day. This, you can't get any more small town than that. <laughs> But it was, it was a lovely feeling about it, a lot of which I think still remains, even though it's gotten bigger and more affluent and all that. I personally still have a feeling that it's a small town at heart. Thank you. I do too, and I came a little later than that. <laughs> um, the, you talk about the small town. The original um, Deputy Munson was the policeman, fire department, the general store and mailman and <laughs> he was everything and they paid his wife fifteen dollars um, a month to uh, answer the phone that was the police department and fire department remember and he used to go uh, patrol the area and it wasn't until um, I think that was about 19 what 24 well, that's where we moved in. and then a couple years later he decided that the city was getting too big and he needed help so they hired another person to come and help him and they had a two-man staff Back in 1946, the motion picture industry had an office called the Society of Motion Picture Independent Producers, and it was located in the Pantages building on Hollywood Boulevard, which at that time was still the center of the so-called Hollywood movie industry. It was very glamorous at Hollywood and Vine in those days. And one day, I was the man who was the head of it was Donald Nelson, who had been the head of the War Production Board in Washington. That's how I happened to be with him as his secretary, because I worked for him in Washington. He came and he said, We've decided we're going to move our offices to Beverly Hills. Well, at that time, we heard about Beverly Hills, but I had really never even been there. And uh, we said, why? He said, because we know that the motion picture industry is going to be moving out that way. And we found a very nice location at 357 North Cannon Drive. Now, if you don't know, remember, it's a little gray building right near little Santa Monica Boulevard. And um, so we moved out there, and it was quite a change. I remember the, where we used to go to eat, uh, the, the Newberries had a counter. Uh, there was Jones, Jones Fine Food. They had a wonderful health food counter, you might remember that. And then there was the, the Anderson name reminded me of the Gourmet Restaurant. The Gourmet Restaurant, I don't know if that's a relative of Mr. Anderson here. Was that your father? It was one of the best places in town to eat. And of course there was Armstrong and Schroeder, which was, uh, which still, still cannot be replaced. And I remember I met Pete Schroeder at one time, who was the owner of that restaurant. Uh, he came to one of the Rotary Club meetings where we, they used to meet at the Beverly Hills Hotel, where I had an office too, after I gave up the motion picture office. And um, he said he was going to retire, but he was afraid of it. And uh, I said, why, Mr. Schroeder? He said, everyone I knew who ever retired died. And wouldn't you know, he did die six months after that. Uh, anyway, uh, there weren't too many places to eat in those days. Like right now, you walk up and down the streets and you see restaurant after restaurant. You didn't even know they're there. They're stuck away in little corners. Uh, but it was a, a wonderful feeling at that time. It really was a small town. And uh, you felt very privileged to be there. Uh, I see the changes and I cannot say I like them. I have to live with it. At that time, it was not uncommon for us to see maybe the Shah of Iran or Lily Ponds or some great dignitary from Europe, Sir Victor Sassoon. They were all in the coffee shop when that was first built there. Because at that time, people were not traveling the world. It was right after the war. And so the world came here. And I think that's what caused Beverly Hills to become great. Some of the things that's happened to me and uh, I saw happen when I worked at the Beverly Hills Hotel in 1948 to 1950. Uh, summer, summer jobs and at uh, vacation from UCLA at Christmas time, I relieved a lady running an elevator. I didn't know any of the distinguished people in the community very much except our neighbors and uh, it was very exciting. Some of the funniest stories were concerned one of the guests, Spencer Tracy, another was Norma Shearer. 
and another was a lady who shall be nameless, but she and her husband came out from Chicago and took us a, the corner, the best room in the, the best suite in the hotel, an apartment. Uh, and uh, we know who their name is, but we won't mention it. Some of their relatives may still be around. But this lady was eccentric. And uh, one time, Norma Scherer, who lived directly underneath, was having a cocktail party. This lady decided she didn't like the noise of the cocktail party, so she tore up literally dozens of newspapers and floated confetti down over the party. Another time, she took all of the, uh, the sheets out of the linen closet and hung them over the balcony uh, to let people know she was there. The best one was that when Spencer Tracy came to ask me one morning, he said, Winston, where the devil are my shoes? Or would you see that the boot black gets them back to me? I said, uh-oh, I'll see what I can do. Unfortunately, Mrs. Jennis didn't like Spencer Tracy leaving his shoes out for the boot black at night. She lived right across the hall from him. I mentioned her name, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> she had taken them and thrown them over the balcony, and they were found by the gardener. Wonderful stories, wet is English shoes. One other story, in there, uh, and it's my favorite. It hasn't anything to do with the stars, but it does give you some idea about the, um, the broad range of patrons that we serve at the Beverly Hills Library. We have a lot of people who, frankly, are street people. Um, and one of my favorites was a very tiny lady whom my staff called the shopping cart lady, not implying that she was a relative of mine, although my name is Cart, but rather because she pushed a supermarket shopping cart with all of her earthly possessions in it, and she parked it in the lobby of the library over in Rexford, and then would spend the day in the library. And she was very ingenious about contriving to get herself locked in the library so she'd have a warm place to sleep at night. So we had to send a patrol out every evening when we were closing to find the shopping cart lady and advise her of the library library was closing. Well, one day, one of my staff members discovered her in the ladies' restroom washing her hair in, a, in the sink. And my staff member suggested this was probably not the appropriate uh, thing to be doing in the uh, ladies' room at the library. And um, the incident passed. Several days after that, um, the same shopping cart lady presented herself at the circulation desk, a la Mr. Dean, and demanded that she be given a library card. And once again, uh, we explained to her that, uh, well, she had to be a resident, and did she have any identification? Well, no, but she lived in Beverly Hills. She was a longtime resident. She demanded a library card. Well, this was getting it out of hand, so, of course, they, the staff called administration. And being a good library director, I was not there. So my assistant was summoned to the front desk to deal with her. He had been told the story about uh, her washing her hair in the sink and all of that. So after listening to her harangue patiently for a few moments, he said, well, I, th I find it odd that if you're a resident of Beverly Hills, that you were, you were washing your hair in the sink in the, in the ladies' restroom. And she thought about that for a second and then drew herself up and said, my dear man, I'm a busy woman. I don't have time to go home for every little thing. <laughs> you were talking about um, having uh, the small town atmosphere. In 1979, we moved from Chevy Chase down to Linden. I guess 1977, 78. And it was again a rainy day. And uh, my husband decided that he would drive our son to El Rodeo School, which was only a few blocks away, but because it was raining, he decided to do that. Now, at the time, I was safety chairman of El Rodeo School PTA, and um, my husband took my son to school, and there was a stop sign. He was talking to my son and looking at him, and he slid through a stop sign, going very slowly, but he went through the stop sign, and the policeman saw him and stopped him, and my husband rolled down his window and was very chagrined, and he said, oh my goodness, he said, this is terrible. On top of the fact that I have done this and I could have hurt a child because it was, the stop sign was there and there was a crosswalk for children, he said, my wife is <laughs> safety chairperson at El Rodeo School PTA. And so instead of giving my husband a ticket, the policeman in 1978 brought my husband home rang the doorbell and he said, excuse me, are you Mrs. First? And I said, yes. And he said, and is this your husband? And I said, yes. And he said, well, he went through a stop sign and he said, I think that you will be much better taking care of this incident than I will be. So we're still a small town. I guess I too lived in the country because I lived in the valley before Beverly Hills. I grew up in this area, 
And then um, I moved to the valley, and when we moved back into Beverly Hills, I was so excited that I could ride my bike into the um, shopping area. And I, I bought this bike at Hans Ort, which was on the corner of Camden and Santa Monica, and, and I had it fitted with this darling little basket. And I drove into Beverly Hills, and I thought, well, I'm going to go to the stationers, and I'm going to go to the market, and I'm going to do all these little things like a small town. And then I forgot. I went to the stationers, and I started buying things, and I, I was buying file cabinets, and I was buying <laughs> all these. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, my gosh, I have my bike. So I talked to the owner at the time of Beverly Stationers, and I told him my predicament, and he said, oh, no problem. He says, we'll just take you and your bike in the, in the truck, and they took me to, back to my house. <laughs> it is a small town. <laughs> I just remember one thing that has not changed since I can, as far back as I can remember. Ever since I can remember, the cops have been trying to keep people from crossing the middle of the block on Beverly and Cannon Drive with no more success than they're having today. That goes back to, to 1930s. They used to try and stop you, and it's like a flood across the street. That's the only thing that I think hasn't changed one single bit in all these years. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, is there anyone from the audience, I'd like to get some of your feedback that would like to talk and tell us some things? Sure. I don't know if this is going to reach up there. Beverly Hills was a terrific place to grow up. I don't know how many of you started here and went all through the schools. For me, it was Beverly Vista, Beverly High School. We came here in 1925, and uh, there were so few people down in uh, so few houses in our area that you could see from Oakhurst clear to the Carthay, Carthay Circle Theater when the streetcar was coming down, so we knew when my dad was coming home. We used to play football in the streets, and that was when it was allowed. I remember one time having dinner and hearing this tremendous sound of airplanes. Went out to look at it. It was the Shenandoah flying down Wilshire Boulevard. I'm giving my age away. Uh, I think so many great recollections of Beverly Hills. Uh, do any of you remember Beverly Drive when we used to have a toy store that we used to get the, the big jawbreakers at for very little money? When Beverly theater opened, I think I went to the first Saturday matinee. Remember Saturday matinee? They had a, a coming attractions, they had a serial, they had um, a comedy, and then they had one or two features. And I remember winning a door prize there one time at a drawing. Tickets to Catalina, what a big deal. Beverly Hills just is very important to me and very wonderful to hear these people come and share. Because somewhere along the line, I think we all share something that is going to live for a long time. I remember we were not with the, the greats except where once in a while we touched shoulders. I remember as a kid walking up to the Beverly Hills Hotel and hearing our mayor talk to the people in that time. It was the honorary mayor, Will Rogers. The only other contact, strange contact, I had with him was a few years later when I was called early in the morning to come and help sell a special edition of a newspaper announcing that Will Rogers had just been killed. These, these are great times, and seeing these pictures of Beverly Hills, that just brings back a lot of memories, and I want to thank you very much for what you're doing. This is tremendous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bob was a wonderful docent, and his wife Becky, they were docents at one of our home tours. And I, I want to thank all of you for coming, and especially our panel. I think that was wonderful. And please come up, enjoy looking through all the photographs. We have refreshments in the back. This is the trolley car station that is still there from May 1912. This is where the trolley car, the Tunerville trolley, would come up and drop the people off. And it's still that building there no idea. on That's Sunset Boulevard. Of course. That's the same building right there where the trolley car would come up. These are some gazebos in the back area. This is the Sunland Water Company. These are um, original floor plans that they'd send out to guests that were staying there. <laughs>